thank you for coming. Uh, it's um, finals week, so we were worried that no one would come. Um, we were mistaken in our worries, obviously. So thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Carl Pearson. I'm the assistant director in the Center for the Study of the Middle East. Uh, we're the sponsor of today's lecture. We're passing around a, a sign-up sheet um, that we collect your names and we send them to the government. Um, <laughs> really? No, we don't send your names. Uh, we count the number of people that are here to report to the Department of Education because they're our funders. Um, so if you would be so kind as to sign it. If you'd like to join our uh, listserv, you can put your email address down. It's up to you. Um, today, we're uh, pleased to have Miles Vining here, who's recently back from Syria. Um, before I introduce him, I'll just say that this spring, Sesame hopes to have uh, further lectures on the topic of the crisis in the northern Levant. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to uh, uh, describe it, but uh, the crisis in Syria and uh, Turkey. Um, so uh, be on the lookout. Watch this space, as they say. Um, and uh, if you are maintain interest, um, please feel free to come back in the spring. Um, so without further ado, today's speaker is Miles Vining. Um, if uh, you have been around Sesame long enough, you may remember him. He was once an intern here. Um, so uh, Sesame uh, affiliates go on to do great things, apparently. Um, so that's always nice to see. Uh, Miles' talk today is called Betrayal to Survival, Realities and Implications of the Turkish Invasion of Northeastern Syria. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, Hi guys, thank you so much for coming today, and I want to thank Sesame especially for allowing me to talk about this on uh, a little bit short notice, and uh, especially doing finals week. Um, I know everyone's busy, everyone has stuff to do, and I know um, what how hectic life can get during this last period of the semester. Um, can we get the lights? Is that all right, or? I don't know. Can we, do, or do you guys usually have lights on or off? We usually have them on. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. We might be able to reduce it a bit. That's good. That's good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so first off, before I talk about this, uh, what the events that have happened in northeastern Syria after the Turkish invasion of October 8th, October 9th, the first thing that I really want to say is um, you, you could make this talk about so much of what has happened in Syria. You could make this exact talk about um, what has happened in Belus this year, what has happened after Raqqa, what has happened after the Battle of Kobani, what has happened in Halib, what has happened, is currently ongoing in Idlib, from all the different sides. And the, the horror and the misery and the tragedy that has befallen the Syrian people of every ethnicity, of Arabs, Kurds, Yazidis, um, Assyrian, Assyriac, um, is, uh, the, the Christian communities there as well, is a really, really hard thing to take in a lot. And that's been going on since 2011. And this is yet another chapter in that horror. Um, so first I'd like for people to think about that as I'm going on with this, that this is one iota of an issue within the greater context of what has become the Syrian civil war. So first, to get started, to tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about the stuff I do, um, and how I was in Syria. So I'm a volunteer with an organization called the Free Burma Rangers. The Free Burma Rangers is an international humanitarian relief group that has been working in Burma, Sudan, Iraq, and currently Syria since 1997. We are a very small, very niche group. I don't want to talk too much about FBR. I'm not an FBR spokesperson. Um, I'm not here to talk about what FBR has done or hasn't done. That's not my job. My, what I want to do today is talk about some of the things that we witnessed and that we saw and that we saw um, working with Kurdish and Arab forces in Tel, in Tel Tamer and Inisa, um against the Turkish invasion. But a little bit, a little bit more about just who exactly what we are, what we do and what we are. Um, the primary thing that we do is we provide medical services in conflict areas where uh, other NGOs have a tough time or cannot go to for a variety of reasons. We provide frontline casualty support. 
We work with kids programs and um, various spots there for children and families who are caught up in the fighting. And then we also do humanitarian stuff such as bringing in you know, food, water, um, clothes, um, tents even at some points. Earlier in the year, we were in Bagus. This picture, these two pictures right here is on the left is of a, a kid coming out of the, the last stronghold of ISIS in Bagus. Bottom here is a water pile of where we were handing out water to people coming out of Bagus. <coughs> to illustrate to you how small we are, this is about the size of our entire team with different flags representing different countries that we're in. The, uh, a lot of our people are from uh, Burma, from some of the ethnic tribes there, uh, Karen, Shan, um, Kareni, Kachin. Uh, the stuff we do, the work that we get into can be a little dangerous. This, this particular mission that we were at in Syria, one of our members was killed. Um, a gentleman by the name of Zhao Seng, he was a Kachin ranger from northern Burma. He was uh, about 40 years old, and he was killed when a Turkish slash FSA mortar landed near one, our position when we were supporting casualties at the front line. So it is not without its risks, and, but despite that, we believe in what we do, and we believe that we want to continue doing it. So I know a lot of people here might know a lot about the war and a lot about what's happened since 2011. For those who don't know or want to fill stuff in, I want to go over just a little bit of the finer points of it. I've got two maps up on here. I think everybody knows what the black represents in the first one. This is the so-called Islamic State at its height, um, extending from one of its original bases in Raqqa, which was along the Tigris River, and then going all the way to Mosul, to Fallujah, to Ramadi in Iraq. The red, as it maintains in this picture. The second map is kind of what Syria looked like at the beginning of the Turkish invasion. But the red in both are Assad or regime-controlled areas, based in Damascus, and then the top left portion, they're a light green in both pictures, is this province of Idlib, where a lot of the, ex well, what began as sort of the rebel groups in Syria, later turned into the extremist groups, um, sort of retreated and sort of had a stronghold, where they still are today. Uh, the yellow is what is known as the Syrian Democratic Council, the Syrian Democratic Forces. This started out as a Kurdish resistance to ISIS and later became, with U.S. support, what would turn into the Syrian Democratic Forces, which was a mixed bag of ethnicities I'll talk about in a second. What we're looking at in terms of when the invasion kicked off with Turkey is a group called the Free Syrian Army. And the Free Syrian Army is an old name. Turkey changed its name to the SNA, or the Syrian National Army. Um, in addition, you also hear this called as a TFSA, or Turkish Free Syrian Army, or Turkish-backed Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army originally began as a resistance to Assad in 2011 when the revolution kicked off. And what we see where the Free Syrian Army grew and the, the fighters who were part of the invasion, were a lot of them actually came from the refugee camps inside Turkey, of which Turkey has over 2.7 million Syrian refugees. These are sort of fighters that were recruited and groomed and trained by Turkish forces for this particular invasion. Turkey has been wanting to invade this part of Syria for a long time. They almost did it in December when President Trump first said the U.S. was going to withdraw from northeastern Syria. They didn't after there's a lot of public fanfare and to include um, former General Mattis resigned um, over that uh, almost decision. The decision that did, take place, that did take place in a second set the groundwork for Turkey invading. So, this, the Syrian civil war is extremely complex. I'm certainly not an expert at it. I'm certainly not you know, a genius at it. But I'm going to try to break down some of the reasons of why Turkey especially wanted to invade this part of Syria. So in a nutshell, we have this organization called the PKK, which is to some countries labeled as a terrorist organization. To other countries, it is an independence movement started by Abdullah Ocalan in 19, 1989 in South uh, southeastern Turkey. And the PKK, this command structure is sort of interesting because it also lists um, the KRG and it lists the Kurds in northern Iraq. And 
one of the overarching goals of the Pakaka and somewhat connected to Abdul Ojalan is this idea of an independent Kurdistan, of connecting the Kurds in all four countries, in Syria, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. Um, from a stand, from an outside standpoint, this sounds like an idea that could work. From my experience working in Iraq and working in Syria, um, and working with a lot of Kurds in all these different places, a lot of, a lot of Kurds don't have interest in this idea. The Kurds in Iraq like what they have, the KRG, the autonomous region, the Kurds in Syria defer a lot with the Kurds in Iraq, and the Kurds in Iran and the Kurds in Turkey are different as well. So this idea of a national sort of independent Kurdistan is, is an interesting one, however which way you cut it. A lot of Kurds, some Kurds support it, a lot of Kurds in all four places don't. But we have the Pakaka, and we have uh, the KCK, which you can't see up top here, but is sort of an international um, union of Kurds that Pakaka falls under. In Syria, you have a political organization called the PYD, which has lasted for a while, uh, since 2011, since before 2011, northeastern Syria. Under the PYD, you have the military arm of the PYD, which is the Yapaga and the Yapaja. The Yapaga are, is, translates to men's defense units, and the Yapaja is female defense units. A common thing within the Pakaka and the Yapaga, um, the overarching thing is, um, well, freedom of religion, um, equality of genders, and this is how they work that, is that in every unit you have a joint Yapaga, joint um, Yapaga, uh, Yapaja unit, and you'll have like a female commander and a male commander, that's an example of that. Um, but that's sort of how they build this philosophy. Turkey does not see any, any difference between the PYD and the Pakaka in Turkey. So when Turkey looks at the PYD and the Yapaja and the Yapaga, they call this uh, terrorists in Syria. All right, there's no, in fact, when they talk about um, uh, Yapaga fighters in Syria, you sometimes see Turkey label it as Yapaga slash Pakaka. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this uh, a lot in the media. So Turkey uh, does not have an interest in supporting any of these organizations over here, despite the US support. Now, where the US support comes in is that when the fight against ISIS started happening, you know, the US is supporting a bunch of groups that later turned out to be the Free Syrian Army in Idlib. These groups turned out to be not as good as what the US wanted. They weren't effective tactically. They weren't um, as, um, as you know, democratically loving as some might say. But they found a good opponent in ISIS um, when it came to the Yapaga and the Yapaja. They were effective, they were motivated, and they wanted to fight against this ISIS group. So the US wanted to back them, but the problem was that a lot of the Pakaka commanders in Turkey saw Syria as a way to sort of insert themselves to fight against Turkey from the south. Um, Turkey, uh, Turkey saw this as well. Um, and even to this day, you still have a lot of uh, Yapaga commanders who are straight from the Pakaka. They've simply crossed the border and they've simply been in charge of units there. The way the U.S. saw this as our, a solution is how we still have to fight ISIS is that we're going to form this group called the Syrian Democratic Forces. This is their flag. In Arabic, it's Quat es Suria al Demokratia. Um, this is the Kurdish translation. And can anyone point out what the translation is on the bottom, what language this is? It's not Arabic. Syria. Syria. A Syri. It's Syriac. Sometimes a lot of people miss it. Um, but this represents the, the Syriac portion of the SDF, which was is, uh, local um, Christians who have been in the area for a long time. The Syrian, the Syriac language is actually <coughs> extremely old at, at that time as well. So the SDF became this force against ISIS. Um, it was composed of the Yapaga and Yapaja, but that only made up a certain component of the SDF. There are a number of Arab military councils. There are a number of Syriac military councils. We even have Armenian military councils in there. And when I say military council, what this means is a number of different cities within the northeastern part of Syria form their own sort of contingents, and they join the SDF. So you'll have uh, the military council from Mimbij. You'll have the military council from Raqqa. You'll have the military councils all over the place. And they're these sort of these units from these areas. And then this is their contribution towards the military component of that. Anyways, Turkey, doesn't see, Turkey sees the SDF as sort of a masking of 
the PKK in Syria. Turkey is, has always been against it, um, despite U.S. efforts to support it, and that's especially what Turkey doesn't like at all. So December, um, Trump declares that he's going to pull out of Syria. There's people don't like it. He doesn't do it. ISIS is defeated in Baguz in February and March of this year, um, which Baguz is a small little hamlet of a place right about this corner of eastern Syria, right where the Tigris um, enters Iraq. Um, it's actually right on the border of Iraq there. So what happens in early October of this year is that over a simple phone call, over one weekend, um, Erdogan has a phone call conversation with Trump, and Trump essentially gives him the green light to invade Syria. And not only does he give him a green light, as, uh, as it's called, um, but he get, says, you can invade, and U.S. forces are neither going to uh, support the local SDF forces on the ground, and they're neither going to do anything against your invasion either. In fact, they're actually going to withdraw. And the U.S. forces in northeastern Syria withdraw. In a piecemeal way, it's not all at once, and there's a lot of back and forth, as we saw on the ground, we saw U.S. convoys leaving back to Kamishali, which is in the far northeastern portion there, and U.S. convoys going back to their old bases, picking up stuff, bringing stuff out. But essentially, the U.S. presence in northeastern Syria is nil after that invasion. So the invasion starts October 8th. Um, airstrikes, artillery starts happening. October 9th is when it really kicks off. And how it works is... So to back up a little bit, this part of Syria that Erdogan invaded, this part was wanted by Erdogan. It was wanted by Turkey beforehand. This was a known thing. The SDF knew that Turkey wanted this area because the SDF before all this, in uh, the summer of this year, had declared that they wanted a safe zone, a buffer zone, that was according to these specifications. It was going to be 30 kilometers deep. It was going to be 40 kilometers or so long. And they wanted this buffer zone against the Yapaga, against the Yapaja, against what they saw as the Pakaka in Syria. Um, why they wanted this particular thing, they really didn't want um, the Pakaka in Syria. Um, but you got to remember, when they talk about the Pakaka in Syria, when we talk about that, the Pakaka that are there and the Yapaga and the Yapaja fighters that are there are forming, this, are forming only a component of the SDF and the SDC. There's a whole other part of this component of majority of it being Arabs, majority of it being Assyrians, who are all throughout this northeastern part of Syria. In fact, the majority of the cities in this part of Syria are not Kurdish majority. Um, so this is not like a Pakaka area that is completely um, known to them. There is that connection, um, which, which, which Turkey turned into this sort of bigger thing, wanting this buffer zone. When Turkey, Turkey wanted this to happen, and, I, and the US negotiated for it essentially not to happen, by offering to dismantle the defenses that the SDF had made on the border with Turkey. So the SDF made all sorts of defenses in terms of tunnels, in terms of fighting positions, because the SDF knew this was coming. And what the US essentially brokered a deal with Turkey and the SDF is they said, look, how about instead of you invading this safe zone and creating it, how about we take out these defenses and you not invade? And Turkey agreed to that. And you saw what good that did in that the United States essentially disarmed the SDF against these guys. And then the US then said, OK, you can come in. You can green light that invasion. So this happens. And there's two fronts that developed. To give you a bit of context, this is nor uh, northern northeastern Syria. This is a highway called M4. This highway runs across the entire northern part of the country. It goes from Kamishli, which is the biggest city uh, to the east, and it goes all the way to Mimbij, which is another big city over here. It's off the map, and it continues going um, to, into northwestern Syria. You have two big cities that are on this highway called Ainisa, which means the eyes of Jesus in Arabic, over here to the left, to the west, and then you have another one called Teltumr 
over here to the east. A little note on names here as well is that because of the two, the Kurdish and the Arab populations in these areas, you have a lot of cities that have uh, dual names. You have a Kurdish name and an Arab name. Kamishali can be Kamishali or Kamishalo. You have the city of Ras Al Ain in Arabic or Serakani in Kurdish. On the west side, you have a city called Tal Abiyad in Arabic and then Jerzbia in Kurdish. And you'll hear and you'll hear these two names. These names are interchangeable with each other. If you pay attention to who's saying these names, if you pay attention, are they using the Arabic name for it or are they using the Kurdish name for it? You'll see that um, you know an Arabic language news source or you know FSA or Turkish uh, supporter will use the Arabic name for it. You'll see you know an SDF supporter or a Kurdish news source will use the Kurdish name for it. So that's a little bit of a key there as well. And so you've got these two big cities, four big cities actually. You've got these two cities on the M4. The M4 is strategic because it's this highway, hardball highway that runs through northern Syria. And it's important because you can, you know, you can drive big trucks on it, you can transport oil, you can transport armies, you can transport commercial stuff. It's a very important highway, uh, lifeblood of the region, if you may. Um, so if you cut off this highway, you know, this is thinking in strategy, then you've cut off some of the lifeblood of the forces on the ground. Um, Tal Tamer and Ainisa especially are hubs. With Tal Tamer, you can have a hub going to Hasaka, which is over here. And Tal Tamer is actually in Hasaka province. Um, Hasaka is another big city in northeastern Syria. Um, so you can go from you know, Tal Tamer to the border. You can go from Tal Tamer down the rest of the highway. You can go to Kamishli. You can turn around and go to Hasaka. Same thing with Ainisa. You can go south to Raqqa. You can keep on going to Mimbij, um, which is further to the west. And then you can also go to Tal Abiyad. So big, important cities. The Turks wanted those cities, but they still haven't got them. The plan was to try to strike down and try to seize both of them. However, before these two cities, you have two other cities that are of importance which is the Kurdish Arabic sound uh, names that I was telling you before. Serakani to the east, and then Talabiyad to the west. They had to seize these two first because these were, seen, these were big defensive positions within the SDF. Now, Talabiyad sort of fell first because the defenses in, in it weren't as built up. Whereas Serakani had an extensive tunnel network that the SDF and the Yapaga used. Now, a little bit on the, on the forces at this point. When Turkey invaded, it's not as if the SDF um, sort of split and there was just Kurdish fighters and then Arabic Assyrian fighters. There were still a lot of Arab fighters as well who were still fighting alongside the Kurds in every step of the way. The Kurds felt, um, the Kurds felt more of an impetus to defend their homeland at this point, but so did a lot of the Arabs because a lot of the areas here are also Arab as well. In particularly on the east side, between Tel Tamer and Ras Al Ain, or Sarakani, you have this river called the Khyber River. And this Khyber River, it's, uh, it's an ancient community of Christians that also live there as well. So you have another minority that you're throwing into the mix. So the invasion takes place, um, and the SDF just starts getting slaughtered every single day. And this actually continues into into when we show up uh, with the Free Burma Rangers on about October 15th of this year. Invasion, you know, the land invasion goes on the 9th. Um, we race to try to get in there and we show up on the 15th. And this, this continues a pattern of almost every single day you see these horrific casualties encountered by the SDF, mostly due to precision, stri precision strikes with drones and aircraft. And I'll talk about those in a second as well. Um, you have to remember, this is a force that pr uh, before relied on extensive U.S. support, relied on extensive U.S. air power, relied on coalition air power um, to defeat ISIS, which there were, they did take a lot of casualties on the ground. Don't, don't make any mistake about that. Over 10,000 Kurds and Arabs died fighting ISIS. Um, but they're used to this force, is used to that, and now they're confronted with no air power, no heavy support, no artillery, and they're confronted with Turkish artillery. They're confronted with uh, tanks, with armored vehicles. ISIS had tanks. ISIS had improvised stuff. ISIS had suicide bombers. But ISIS didn't have uh, modern tanks, modern German leopards, modern uh, improvised American M60, M60s that are being used by the Turks. Um, the FSA that the Turks are working with, 
Um, we're being armed by them as well with everything from small arms up into the bigger stuff such as uh, armored personnel carriers, <coughs> mortars, um, and then larger than that, they're being supported by Turkish artillery, they're being supported by Turkish drones, they're being supported by Turkish F-16s that were striking all these targets all along here. And some of, and some of the responses to this were almost comical. Um, we saw in the beginning, we saw a lot of the use of umbrellas. Because there is this belief within the SDF that if they used umbrellas, uh, large size umbrellas, you know, they could hide from the thermal cameras on the drones. Um, and it, it, it was just, it was sad to see because they'd be using these umbrellas thinking it would save them, but umbrellas aren't going to save you against a thermal camera on a drone. Tur um, I'll go into the Turkish drones later. But the point I want to get across is that just from the beginning of the invasion, they're almost on the losing side every single day. They are barely holding on everywhere. And with the two cities especially, even though there's an extensive tunnel network in Ras al Ain, all the FSA had to do was flank the Kurds and they simply encircled Ras al Ain. And after about a week or so, less than a week, the city was entirely encircled. When we got, when we got there on October 15th, there was no clear path into Ras al Ain. That was the, the road into it was completely cut off by the FSA. So what did this produce in terms of IDPs? It produced between 100 to 300,000 IDPs within the first week of the invasion. And that number also fluctuates as well because you have a lot of IDPs that run away. You have a lot of people running away that aren't counted as IDPs because many of them are running away to you know, family houses in Hasaka or Tal Tamer or other areas. Um, but you definitely have 100 to 300,000 within that first week. How does that uh, affect the local economy? Well, as an example on the right, these are kids from, uh, the Sarakani, from the town of Sarakani that ran away to Hasaka. They're living in um, a school at this point. Schools are great for IDP collection sites because, you know, large open spaces, there's a lot of good shelter, there's already public bathrooms, um, it's already, you know, on government record books, it's surrounded by a compound, it can be protected. Schools are great for IDPs going away. But what are they not good, but what's that not good for is the kids and the teachers already in session. So you have these sort of uh, splinter issues where the IDPs getting out of this place are going to these schools, they're being housed there, but great, now you have uh, the education is on standstill while this is happening because the schools, uh, the, the children and the teachers have nowhere to go to school now because their schools are being taken up by these IDPs from Sarakani. Um, a lot more runaway as well in different parts. Everybody's freaking out um, all along that front. Everybody in there is running away. Um, and you have people, some people are running to Iraq. Not too many though because they realize the Turks just want that sort of section. So a lot run away, and then some eventually come back to different areas um, where they realize, okay, you know, that safe zone, as Turkey calls it, um, that safe zone is, you know, hasn't reached Tal Tamer, hasn't reached Tainisa. Tal Tamer, though, people are, people are booking it. People are gone. In addition to locally, when we, uh, when we showed up, you have that, remember where I said the Khyber River Valley? You have all these towns in between Tal Tamar, these sort of villages and hamlets in between Tal Tamar and Sarakani. And you have the people of these villages and the people of these hamlets, they all run away as well. They're not running away as far as Hasaka because they're very local. You know, they, they, they probably don't know anybody in Hasaka. But they're running away just outside of the areas of fighting. And they're re dislocated from that too. Sar Sarakani, especially um, during the fighting, uh, I didn't. I didn't look it up for this particular, um, for this particular slide, but if, uh, if you look at, there's a video um, from the hospital in Tal Tamer at the height of the fighting in Sarakani when the road was still open, and you see the video from the hospital where when we got there, the hospital said they took over 650 casualties in a single day, and that's mostly civilians um, hit from the Turkish fighting in Sarakani and trying to get out. Um, at the same time, at the same time as those civilian casualties are coming in, you know, there's SDF casualties that are, of course, get, coming in and they're getting hit really badly. But that same hospital also had ambulances get targeted, had medical personnel captured and killed um, by FSA factions. So what you're dealing with is the second biggest army in NATO using these proxy FSA forces, and there is no adherence to rules whatsoever. 
there's no Geneva Convention here. There is no, there is no Red Cross, Red Crescent respect. There's none of that. In fact, we'll talk about some of the war crimes that they talked that they uh, they were they were into at the end of this uh, series as well. So, I say that because when when we came in, there's when we came in, and then we're working with um, IDPs on the ground. We're helping them with uh, humanitarian supplies, food, water, blankets, um, stuff like baby milk, stuff like diapers. That stuff is essential for the IDP camps because for babies, you can't get that supplies at all. If you can't change the clothes on the, on, a, on the babies, then they can start to get infected because they're using old clothes. We saw this a lot in Bagus where ISIS widows were using uh, you know, their old clothes as diapers you know, and the kids get infected and then if the kids um, have diseases and they can die really easily. So that kind of stuff is essential for that. But we show up, we provide that kind of thing. We're working with casualty evacuation, we're working with medical evacuation, we're providing um, uh, doctor, well not doctors but medics on the front line. But there's no, and this is why one of, you can see earlier when I was talking about when Zhao was killed and another one of our guys was wounded, there's no, there's no zone of protection here. There's no international standard of, you know, we're medics and you can't shoot us. No, that does not apply whatsoever. This is a proxy force uh, being led by Turkey, doing whatever they want. So, <clears throat> Russ Aline, so Sarah Connie, to explain some of the pictures here. So Sarah Connie gets cut off. Um, on that road from Tel Tumar. So you still have a significant portion of uh, fighters that are still there. And they're still fighting. And they're, they, they think that they're fighting to the death. Um, the SDF has, has some deals with Turkey, which you can read about. And then they ask Turkey to sort of spare these guys and allow them to come out. So, uh, but uh, for the first time that we went into Sarakani, it was with a, uh, a medical evacuation team um, where it was the Kurdish Red Crescent and then also the Syrian uh, Red Crescent that showed up as well. And it was a series of medical vehicles that came in for the purposes of evacuating wounded. Because there's still a lot of wounded um, in Sarakani. This is one of the hospitals. Well, this is the hospital in Sarakani that was filled with wounded. Um, about 40, 40 wounded were taken out that first, that first trip. This is some of them in some of, the, in some of the vehicles going out. These are FSA guys lining the way into Sarakani. These are our vehicles uh, driving out. You can see if you look closely, there's, there's better pictures elsewhere, but that's a Turkish flag, and then that's an FSA flag, and that's another FSA guy. And these guys sort of line the entire road coming in, and from a lot of them, from this particular group right here, they were standing outside and sort of, you know, <coughs> glaring at us as we drove in because we, uh, FBR went in with the, medical, with the medical vehicles that went in as well, with our ambulances too. But, you know, scenes such as them, you know, standing around all outside in a crowd, yelling, chanting, Allahu Akbar the whole time. Some of them were brandishing knives. Like, these are not nice people. These are not people that you should be supporting um, is why I want to get across. So... Sarah Connie happens, um, that road in, casualties come out, eventually, you know, the garrison, as it, as it may, um, gets evacuated as well, as per those negotiations, but the fighting continues through on out. The, the, the problem with that area was that you had that road, when I was showing earlier, this road right here leads all the way back to Tel Tumar. Um, that road was in constant, had a constant issue of being cut off. Every single day, um, the Yapaga forces and the SDF forces that were all along this road in the fighting positions there, everybody had a constant fear of getting cut off, to include us, because we were on that road as well, and we used that road to medically evacuate people. Um, because the fighting went down that river valley, the Chaba River, and then the FSA was trying to essentially flank the road and then go around the road and try to cut off forces from behind. And... It's in that kind of context, you can kind of understand if you look at the early stages of ISIS and you see these, you know, reporters and journalists who get captured and mixed up in the fighting and you think, well, how hard can that be? You know, if they're over here and the bad guys are over there, how hard is it for someone to leave, uh, for someone to get captured if you know where the bad guys are? Well, and this, this illustrates it very well how fluid that environment is for you. one second you know the enemy's over here, the next second you realize the enemy's behind you. 
And it's a very scary feeling at that point. And every day, they're just coming down that road. Um, they eventually made it to, um, they eventually made it just uh, about four, four kilometers outside of Teltummer. So, um, Vice President Pence goes to um, Ankara and he talks with Erdogan. And almost as soon as we show up on about the 20th of October, around that time I'm probably getting the date messed up, um, but there's a ceasefire that's declared. Um, and, you know, Turkey says, oh, there's a ceasefire. And Vice President Pence says, oh, hey, we just negotiated a ceasefire. <laughs> Uh, this was honestly the um, biggest lie that could have ever been pe uh, that could have ever been said throughout this entire campaign. There was no ceasefire um, between those two forces. That night, everyone thought there, that might last. Okay, like great, there's a ceasefire. Um, the entire town of Tel Tumar starts shooting up in the air. People in Hasaka start shooting up in the air. Six people are admitted to the Hasaka hospital because they're killed by gunfire coming back down. Um, everyone's happy, like, yeah, this maybe has ended. No, it hasn't ended at all. Um, despite that ceasefire, the killing goes on and on and on, and the FSA keep advancing, 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 and the Turks back them every single day with their armor, with their drones, with their artillery, um, and then with their air assets as well. Um, so what we see is just this gradual withdrawal throughout that entire time down that road from Ras al Ain to Tel Tamer. Um, the pictures here that I just want to illustrate some of that is these are actually retreating Syrian Arab army or Assad troops that are walking down that road, walking away. Um, this is Tel Tamer in the background. And this plume of smoke, this is, this is not an airstrike or artillery strike or anything. This is actually to prevent drones from seeing what's happening on the ground. Um, it's, a, it's a very common tactic. ISIS has used it. Um, burning tires, you know, it's been used for a long time. But the problem is, and this is sort of where the Kurds got it wrong in trying to combat the drone threat, is they, they never found a way to really get around it. Um, and they would do stuff like this, like umbrellas, um, burning massive amounts of tires. That, this whole crazy cloud over here might work <coughs> if you're driving your vehicles in the immediate vicinity of those tires. But not everything happens within you know, a football size radius. There's stuff that's happening all over the place. The Turks can see through a lot of that. Um, and you also have to remember, I'll say that for the drone part, um, but some more examples on the left here. Um, you have uh, doctors and nurses in Tel Tumor working on SCF casualties. Um, these guys were really amazing. Um, they stayed in Tel Tumor despite the threats every single day of, you know, on, on many days, um, especially when this sort of attack that came down the road, you know, you'd have these villages that would just fall and fall and fall. And, you know, first it was, um, you know, Manajir, which the, the Turks, and um, before that you had um, Asadia, which was another small little hamlet. Okay, who has Asadia today? I don't know. By the end of that day, okay, the Turks have Asadia. Then a couple days later, okay, now they're fighting in this town called Manajir, which is off to uh, the west of that access. All right, Manajir's fought over, and the Yapaga have retreated from that. All right, next city is Soda. And that was actually a city where FBR was, where we had our sort of casualty collection point and where we would go and help out casualties from the front line there. And that was where we, along with, um, the, along with the Asaish, which is the local police, along with the Asaish and the SDF forces that were there, literally got ran out of that town because the Turkish armor and the FSA advanced right into it. And they sort of went through all the SDF defenses that were there. Um, and they were shooting artillery outside of it at the same time as well at the forces as they were going away from it. So you have Soda is gone, Asadia is gone, Manajir is gone. Okay, like what's next? Well, it's, it's like these four hamlets and then it's Tel Tumor. So for these doctors and nurses every single day, and, a lot, and sometimes, a lot of times actually, they would take their ambulances along with ours and we would go directly to the frontline positions to pick up casualties. Um, when it was extremely dangerous, when there was a lot of threats, and they, and they did it. They were, they were amazing guys and girls that worked every single day, um, woke up at night, you know, woke up during the day, 
dealt with over 650 casualties in a single day from Sarakani. This is not a big hospital. This is sort of like a regional, maybe like a, uh, like a Martinsburg uh, level town kind of hospital, and they're working with it. At the top here, this is one of our ambulances. Um, when we went out and we retrieved um, two dead and one wounded from a fight with the FSA when they were coming through a village, and then they had casualties that they really needed us to pick up and take out. Um, and this is why you buy quality body bags, because the blood just drains all out through it. And that, I, this picture means a lot to me, because that's Kurdish and Arab blood sitting in our ambulances right there. And there were many nights when we had to clean out that blood with hoses, wash it down. Um, I had to change my trousers twice in cleaning out, because my trousers were just soaked with blood. Um, so that's kind of the reality of that right there. So this, things get interesting because the U.S. leaves. The U.S. is gone. Um, piecemeal, as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't a complete withdrawal, but the U.S. sort of books it um, from the very beginning. So who's going to take that space up? The SDF immediately turns to Assad, which we think of Assad, he's, he's sort of the bad guy in all this, right? He's like the evil dictator, which he is for, for the most part. He absolutely is. But the SDF looks at Assad as their, their sort of savior at this point, because he comes in and says, OK, the US is gone. Um, I can come and help you. And the SDF says, yes, please do. Come in. And Assad is kind of who the SDF has been working for independence from since 2011. Bear in mind, the SDF has never really, has never really full-on combat fought Assad since 2011. There's been small skirmishes here and there, and commissionally, and uh, demonstrations, and protests, da, da, da. but you've got to remember, um, Assad had a, maintained a base in Kamishli and maintained a base in Hasaka throughout this entire time, still does today. Um, you know, a full Syrian army base. So when the fighting happens and the U.S. leaves, these soldiers from these bases sort of come into town. And it's a very eerie feeling seeing, you know, a uh, Syrian Arab army gun truck just drive right in front of you on the highway. And we were a little bit apprehensive at first. So are they going to arrest us? A bunch of Americans up in here. Uh, what are they going to do? But how it ended up working is sort of, the, sort of the weird opportunities that present themselves in conflict of we were there. We were treating Assad casualties alongside SDF casualties. And they sort of tolerated us and said, you know, you're willing to save our guys and you're willing to help our guys when they're, when they're shot up and they're hit. You know, they allowed us to live, essentially, in that space, um, which I don't know if that would have happened in another sort of circumstance or scenario. But the interesting thing is Assad's guys show up. They're very triumphant. They come in. They come in with their gun trucks and their big buses. They're holding up pictures of Bashar al-Assad. And they're convinced that they're going to turn the tide. Turkey's going to stop right there. And that if they show up, you know, Turkey's going to stop fighting. The problem is they show up. And the Turks start killing them as well. And they don't have heavy weapons. The biggest thing that they have is sort of a 23 millimeter uh, ZPU, which is a little bit bigger machine gun than the one that you see on this truck. They barely have any artillery. Their tanks are all from the 1960s. Um, they don't have air support. They don't have drones. They don't have you know, overhead intelligence. They don't have anything. And so the Turks see them, and the Turks simply say, oh, OK. Great, more targets. And then they start killing them off just like they do with the SDF. And oftentimes you see SDF positions and then the regime positions right next to each other. And then they get captured, they get cut off. Um, the FSA captured an entire squad at one position that we were helping out with their casualties. Um, and that just happens throughout the campaign. So they thought that by their arrival, because you know Assad allied with Russia, starts fighting Turkey, Turkey starts fighting them, this is backed by Russia, it's sort of a World War I scenario, everybody gets in on it. Turkey didn't care about that at all. They killed Assad soldiers just as much as they were killing SCF soldiers every day. So, we have an example, and this is one of our ambulances, these are some Assad guys, um, regime guys, who were hit by mortars, and we were transporting them back to the Teltomer Hospital. Russians are around, and then the Russians show up on the M4 highway, they don't stay in Tel Tumr very much, but we see them a lot drive through on the road. Um, and actually, they show up to US bases, and they occupy the US bases, the former US bases. And if there's a really funny picture of everybody knows you know, the Alamo uh, Texas flag of the cannon and the cannonball that says, come and take it. 
Well, there's a picture of a Russian journalist with Russian forces on a U.S. base holding up this flag that some U.S. forces had left behind. And I kind of look at that and says, well, you know, they took it um, as a kind of a comical note there. But Russians are in. Um, they don't do anything against the Turks, though. They're sort of driving around, and they do these joint patrols with the Turks in uh, Kobani and in some other places on the border where the Turks and Turkish armored vehicles and Russian armored vehicles sort of join together and they do these joint patrolling efforts to sort of say, okay, this is your side of the border, this is my side of the border. Um, Kurds in Kobani don't really like that and you see a lot of videos online of um, Kurds throwing rocks and pelting the, the Turkish armored vehicles. Um, but that continues. But the Russians don't really get involved in any of the fighting. They're sort of just there as a presence. They have a little base in Inisa, but that's about it. So, yeah, the drone strikes. The thing to understand about these Turkish drones, they're Turkish. They're manufactured in Turkey by uh, TAI, Turkish Aircraft Industries. Um, they take off from the, a region of Turkey known as Batman. There's a, uh, that's the, that's like, it's called something like the, one four, the 14th um, aerial, um, aerial, uh, uh, something squadron or something, it's there. And Batman is very close to this front. So the, the drones are overhead all the time because they're so close. And these drones that they have, they use them for surveillance and they also use them for uh, targeting. So they'll have drones with missiles on them and they'll have drones um, that just essentially spy all day long. And some of the issues with them are what I was talking about, you know, with the umbrellas, with the tire smoke, you know, there's ways you think you can evade them, but the way these things work is that the drones will stay overhead all day, and the U.S. does the same exact thing. They'll establish these packages, these target packages, pattern of life, and they'll, fall, they'll simply follow vehicles and people for days, for weeks, and they'll follow, okay, this SDF vehicle went there and there and there. So it's, it's not, the, the problem isn't if you get hit or not. These things are so accurate. If you notice, so this picture here, this is a dead uh, Kurdish fighter whose uh, body that we went to and we picked up and we brought back to the hospital. That's a piece of the drone that hit him and killed him and a couple other guys. And that, that's just a shard. That's the, the, the last fragment that went into the ground. Do you see how accurate that is? That's about a meter from his body. And that's common. That is what happens all the time. We ran across, there was a, um, a, uh, a, a mortar position that we saw. Um, where a drone had tried to strike it, and the drone had literally the base plate of the mortar, which was about you know this this big around, the mortar the the actual uh, munition the missile didn't explode, but it was right next to the base plate. The accuracy of these things is insane. It is equal to or better than a lot of the U.S. drones that we are using in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and it was a very scary feeling being on the opposite side of that because as I said. There's no, there's no immunity here. There's no, hi, I'm a medic, we're here to save people. No, it doesn't matter. These drones will kill you either way. The FSA will kill you either way. They don't care about who they're killing. They just want to kill as many people as they can in that little frontage that they are in. They don't care. This is not a Geneva Convention scenario. So the accuracy was insane. The surveillance was insane. And it's not the fact of, you know, when, the, when that missile is coming towards you, and it's going to blow up your vehicle or blow up your building or blow up your position, that's, that's not the scary part. You're already done by that point because that thing is coming in so fast and it strikes so quickly. The scary part is being surveilled and being watched because everywhere you go, you know drones are watching. You know they're seeing where you park your vehicles. This is a perfect example right here. This is one of our land cruisers. Um, it, next to, for, this is for size, a parking garage that we used to park these in, to hide from the drones. And we would park here close to the front line so we could be better, to, um, um, uh, better able to um, uh, get to the casualties right next to there. If you were in Altel Tummer all the time, it would be hard to you know, get out as fast as possible. Your, your, the delay time would be very difficult, the ambulances. But this is exactly where we were parking our vehicles. And not a day or two after we had parked there several times in a row, that position was hit by a munition and half of it was taken out on this wall. This, this used to be a wall over here. That's the, that's the ceiling. 
These things are the most deadly weapons in the entire campaign. It wasn't the tanks, it wasn't the FSA infantry, it wasn't the Turkish infantry that caused the most casualties. It's the Turkish drones that were just killing the Kurds and Arabs every single day. And we saw it, we went to the vehicles and we picked up the vehicles that were blown up and we went to the bodies and picked them up and there, there's, there'd be very few wounded from these things. You don't walk away from a drone, all right? So that's one of the biggest things that was both killing the SDF and um, they just couldn't figure out a way to get around it. They tried things. They tried the umbrellas. They tried the smoke screens, but they couldn't. Um, er, like, you know, they tried different things, da 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 and for a bunch of other reasons that, you know, go, are way out of the extent of this talk, um, but they couldn't figure out a practical way to get around it. So this is, I want to show you, this is the Inisa front. So we're over at Taltamar for the whole time. We later drive to Inisa, which you have to drive all the way down uh, to Raqqa and then up to Mimbij and sort of back to Inisa. And I'll show you this qui uh, clip very quickly to show you um, the Inisa front was way worse off than the Taltamar one. The Taltamar one, at least uh, the SDF was able to hold off the Turks and able to hold off uh, the FSA at least several kilometers outside the city. In this clip here, you'll see the exact extent of how close the FSA was getting to the city. This clip is filmed from the, uh, the police checkpoint on the M4 that enters the city. Um, you'll hear, so David Eubank, he's the founder of the Free Burma Rangers. Um, you'll hear him talk about they're in the Inisa refugee camp. This was formerly a camp that was first established um, by families that left Raqqa after that offensive. Um, the camp is no longer occupied. There's nobody in there. So there's no civilians. There's no one in there. Um, because that's another side, side aspect of this campaign is that when the campaign kicked off, all these camps, Hall Camp, well, the Hall Camp was relatively okay, but Inisa Camp, for example, you have entire families and sections of the camp all bolted. And I mean, these are camps where... You know, I've seen it in the phrase, people are saying, oh, you know, suspected ISIS uh, families and this and that. No, these camps are filled of ISIS. This is where ISIS left when they couldn't run away. These are camps that when we took our vehicles to them to give out, uh, to do children's programs and to give out some aid, these are camps where the sides of our vehicles, uh, kids were finger painting uh, Daula Islami and were finger painting all the ISIS slogans on the side of, of the vehicles there. So, just a quick, to sort of give you um, a view of what was happening. If it works. So this is November 23rd. 23 November 2019, we're here in Anissa. That's the Anissa refugee camp. Attack today. So, this is the edge of the town. This is the M4 highway. This big road right here. And this is a terrible invasion that has not stopped yet. So thanks for listening. This is sort of a lull in the fighting when we showed up. These are all SDF. That's towards the camp. And now they're taking incoming. That's an FSA mortar or rocket that landed at uh, an SDF position and eventually killed a couple guys that were there. And then pulling the guys out. So this is some of our medics getting in the truck and then taking him back to the hospital in the town. And this, that is the town right there. And then returning fire at the FSA, who's steadily coming in. They kind of beat them off that way, but that was the extent of the invasion on the Inisa front, was right at the town. So, end of the talk. Um, well, well, this is the end but I'll show you little things. Uh, does, can anyone read that for me? What is that? That's for ISIS. It is. So I kind of want to show this. When like when Can you repeat that? Yeah. Al-Dawla Islami, the Islamic State, or the Islamic government. So this, I call this modern art. This is evil and plastic 2019. Um, this is an ISIS coin. There were a ton left over after the fight. This is a, a five. Yeah, this is a, yeah, they're both. Yeah, they're both. This is a Khamsa, and then this one is a Khamsin um, right here. 
Khamstash, uh, 15 and 5. But this is the currency that ISIS had. This is the extent to which ISIS was able to rise. Um, the people in there, the FSA, working with the Turks, you've, you've heard me talk about them. Some of their war crimes going on over here, this is examples of executing Kurdish prisoners. This is examples of mutilating um, Yapaja women fighters um, during the course of the invasion, um, you know, uh, being prideful about it. There's over, over 40, you know, high profile, not high profile, but, you know, of profile um, ISIS fighters are fighting with the FSA, despite what I said earlier, you know, a lot of the FSA is uh, recruited from, Turkey, uh, from refugees already in Turkey, Syrian refugees in there. Um, but you still have a lot of ISIS inside there. In fact, when the Kurds were fighting ISIS, they would refer to the uh, FSA as little ISIS or, or, ISIS or ISIS minor league. And they didn't see any difference with there. And there are a lot of position, there are a lot of uh, accounts of FSA positions, you know, Previously, one day before, there were ISIS positions, and then through negotiations and this and that, the next day, they're looking at those positions from uh, the Kurdish side, and then they see change from an ISIS flag to an FSA flag. Um, already, with the invasion, you already have a lot of support um, coming back for ISIS in terms of, um, you know, cells popping up in Hasaka. You still have a lot of sleeper cells that are waking up or coming back to life. Um, just as Baghdadi was killed, which, by the way, Baghdadi was killed at the same time as the invasion. Um, similarly with sort of the US, def U.S. defeat of ISIS, personally, I look at that sort of stuff, and I see that there wasn't a U.S. defeat of ISIS. The U.S. didn't shed any, any blood defeating ISIS. It was the 10,000 Kurds and Arabs who, that, that, is the that is who the defeat belongs to. This wasn't a U.S. defeat. We didn't, we didn't, the U.S. did not learn anything from this. If we learned anything from this, then we wouldn't have abandoned our allies to die in this stupid invasion. All right? That's my opinion on that matter. But this is, this is the implications of this invasion happening. The other side of this is you see, so you see stuff like this going on. You see stuff like this. This is in Sarakani. You see a lot of, um, a lot of the promises that you see uh, FSA guys getting, that Turkey promised them, it says, hey, you know, you fight for us in the invasion, um, you'll, you'll be able to get a house for your family in Sarakani or um, Jerbespia in the other town. Um, and you see that happening already. You see accounts online. You see accounts of, you know, Turkish mayors being appointed for these different towns as well, essentially annexing this part of Syria for Turkey. Um, Erdogan's plan is he wants to take these 2.7 million refugees, Syrian refugees in Turkey, and input them into this safe zone into Syria. This is, not, this is not a secret. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is out there. You can read about it. You can see it. This is what Erdogan wants to do. He wants to clear out this formerly Turkish, Arab, Syriac, these Syriac lands and take these refugees that he have been in Turkey, you know, support Turkey by this point because Turkey's given them everything, and then pump them into this safe zone in Turkey, and then have that be, that's his buffer zone against what he sees as the PKK in Syria. So, talk about that. I know a little bit over time. Um, I'll pass this around as well. You guys can see it. Do you have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Develop this this is why the invasion happened, because he didn't want something to happen in Rojava. He didn't want a Kurdish affiliated democratic group, any group, to exist in Rojava. This is well this is what I believe, this is what we've seen throughout the, throughout this invasion. Um, yeah. Anyone else? <clears throat> yes, sir. Is there <clears throat> any uh, tension between the official Syrian army and the Turks uh, about, uh, on the Turkish plan to use this as a uh, buffer zone? Well, there's, yes, there is. There's, there is tension because Assad, Assad has already said that he wants you know, all of Syria for Syria. You know, that includes not the SDF. He doesn't, he doesn't want the SDF as part of that plan. Um, but no, Assad doesn't want this invasion. Assad wants Turkey gone as well, as well as the SDF. 
Um, if we're up to Assad today, Idlib, that, that Turkish buffer zone, and the SDF would disappear. And that would all just be back to Syria. And as you can tell, when the Syrian troops showed up to fight in Tel Tamar, they thought they were going to end it. They were getting killed just as much as the SDF were. There was no discrimination in who was getting killed on the front line. So Syria is not making a serious effort against uh, the Turkish uh, occupation? They are in that they're sending troops there. And they have, they're sending troops with sort of Russian support. But the problem is the Assad's army is so weakened by now. You're dealing with conscripts and draftees who a lot of them don't want to be there anymore. So there's, there's, there's nothing Assad can do. Assad can barely hold on to Idlib. You've, you've seen in that, that little section I saw in Syria with Idlib, that's, that's not occupied by a conventional army. That's occupied by an insurgency. Assad can't even squelch that. There's definitely nothing he can do against a conventional army with tanks, drones, armored vehicles, um, all the support that that has. Assad can't do anything about it. So, um, yeah. If you permit another question. Yeah. yeah. Oh. You said that the U.S. is completely gone from this area. Uh, the New York Times reports that um, there are some American troops in the eastern mode part of Syria mm -hmm. uh, to supposedly to protect the oil uh, ref refineries and oil uh, there. What do you think about that? I think they're. Uh, I think that in the uh, in the northeast. There's two parts. Yeah. So the oil producing parts of this part of Syria, you have oil down south in uh, this province of Deir Zor, and then you also have oil up to the far northeast, uh, east of Kamishli. There, both of these parts are very far away from the fighting, which is happening right around here. What I think about that is I think the U.S. is protecting the wrong assets. The assets of Syria are the Syrian people, not the oil coming out of the ground. Well, um, I guess that's a matter of opinion. But um, anyway, uh, for, um, for Trump's interests, uh, the people who support him, um, I suppose the protecting those oil assets makes some sense. The idea that he's put forth is that you protect the oil and the oil would be used to fund groups like ISIS. That's why ISIS wanted that oil in the beginning. And ISIS used the oil wells to sort of as, a, you know, as part of their budget, as part of their finances. And the idea is you know, protect the oil and then other groups can't have it. That's the idea behind that, is that the wrong groups can't have it. Doesn't this benefit the um, Iraqi Kurds? The Iraqis are just on, on the other side of the border. The Iraqi, the Iraqi Kurds aren't really involved in this, involved in that sort of aspect kind of thing. The Iraqi Kurd, like, and this is what I was saying earlier with like a lot of people are saying, whoa, Kurdistan, unite this whole part. You know, it's the only group in the Middle East. It's the only ethnicity in the Middle East without their uh, own nation. And that's why I look at that and I say, nah, the Iraqi Kurds don't really want to be with the Syrian Kurds. They've got their own little slice of heaven in the KRG in the autonomous region in Iraq. They like that. They don't want to, they don't want to share it with what they see as these sort of Uncle Oppo, uh, com, like Kami Yapaja and Yapaga. They don't, they, don't, they don't want us to do that. But they have oil. They do. They have their own oil. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The next. Yeah. Yes. Russia also plays a very prominent role in this by opening the airspace to Turkish drones as well as mm -hmm. air force yes. to be so effective. Yes. And then the deal between Trump and Erdogan itself was just an equal boom to what Turkey has been doing in that area. And Russia is doing this hoping that Turkey will go further and further away from NATO. Mm -hmm. Turkey is a NATO member, not yes. acting as really a Russian ally yeah. at this point. And then hopefully breaking the ties between the two. And so we can see really these two global powers, yes and no, that could be negotiated, really are seen from different angles, agreeing with each other tacitly mm -hmm. to eliminate or you know to, to lead further tragedies here where there is no standards whatsoever. It is just a free shooting zone mm -hmm. where ISIS <coughs> very well come back and it will come back because what gave birth to ISIS the reasons are still there. Mm -hmm. Some some issue of distinctions minorities, 
regimes that only leave no space for diversity, mm -hmm. for ethnic, linguistic, and religious you know, expression. And so we can see that really that area is going to be unstable for a long, long time. And so my question is really, how will, will, will the U.S. still really be able to garner any sort of symbolic or actual support from that area of people? What, what was your sense? You were on the ground. Well, how did people feel? My sense now is that we've lost the opportunity. Before, when we were supporting the SDF and we were supporting this area, you know, there's a million arguments you can make either way to support the SDF. Okay, they're, you know, allied. There's somehow connected with PKK, which is a terrorist organization in, t in Turkey's eyes. Da, da, da. Okay, there's issues there. But the U.S. gave this part of Syria a space. We created a, essentially a safe space in which something could be done. There could be some sort of negotiation. There could be some sort of coming together. There could be some sort of diplomacy. We created that space and we maintained it. But when we withdrew, that space withdrew with it. And now there is no space. Now there's the SDF fighting for its life and bringing Assad in as an ally. Before, there was some sort of, OK, we can you know, create this or create that. But now there's none. Um, so we've lost the opportunity to do that. And in the, eyes, in the eyes of the Kurds and in the eyes of the world, there's no reason to trust the United States after this. Absolutely none. Like, None whatsoever. This is just, first, use us to defeat this evil thing called ISIS, lose 10,000 people, then take away all our defenses, and then allow the enemy to come in and run away. It's the most cowardly thing that I've ever seen. Well, so. We have time for one last question. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. yeah, hey, so first off, I really do want to thank you for doing this. Like, you know, with this, you're going to be able to hold people in power accountable for what are all crimes against humanity. So really, thank you for this. Um, I did just sure. want to ask, uh, what other aid groups were there, and what are the other pressing needs for civilians in that region? I know you were talking about, like, the situation with the kids and stuff, mm. but what other, like, uh, just what other sort of, like, uh, emergencies? The big, I would say right, right now, it being, you know, December 17th, yeah. it's winter in Syria, it's very cold, yeah. um, it's going to get colder. January, February, March are some of the coldest times in the country okay. um, throughout the year. Um, for the IDPs that are there, yeah. they don't, you know, they left their homes. They need warm weather stuff. They need uh, heaters. They need gas. They need all this stuff. That's the urgent thing right now, I'd say, for all the IDPs okay. who, have let, who have been chased out of the area there. Yeah. Um, as in terms of the other aid groups um, that were there, in Tel Tumor, there were some individual volunteer doctors that showed up. There's a good one that I remember. Well, I, I I, we were too busy doing a lot, but some of the other guys in our team knew him uh, from Germany. He showed up and he worked at the hospital. Um, there was there was an aid group called uh, Shadows of Hope that showed up, okay. but they they quickly left. And uh, but the biggest thing I would say is the Kurdish Red Crescent. They were the other. They were the sort of aid group on the ground. And it was, it was like almost so our little group because we're so we're so small. Our entire team is like. 15, 20 people. When we first showed up, our team was 10 people and three vehicles, right? Very small. So our, essentially, our team sort of tasked ourselves to the Kurdish Red Crescent and said, where do you need us? Where do you need us to get casualties? Where do you need us to work on people? And we sort of worked for them, uh, in a way, as an extension. Where are you getting People yeah. Marine Rangers is all volunteer, and we are based off of uh, charities in the US. Um, it's all donations. No, no group in particular like the American Red Cross or something? No. No, what charities in particular were based off of donations? So I think you can look at the budget online. I think it's like $2 million last year or something, and that's working with, um, that's working in Burma, that's working in Iraq, that's working in Syria. We're a very small footprint. So. Please join me in thanking Lon. Well, thank you. Thank you.